Yeah, thanks, Russ. Um, wonderful opportunity. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, start by uh, acknowledging my, uh, my wonderful team and uh, the fact that uh, the work I'll present uh, is the result of a major collaborative effort. First part of my talk, I'll uh, focus on work done in collaboration with, um, with Martine van Schouwenburg uh, in yellow here. Let's see, do we have a pointer? Yeah. Uh, Martine van Schouwenburg and Hanneke den Ouden. And in the second part of my talk, um, I'll present work from Andrew Westbrook, who is here and also will present a poster this afternoon uh, in collaboration with Michael Frank. So, arguably, we live in, uh, in the age of the connectome, where the brain is uh, characterized, conceptualized as a distributed computing system uh, comprising multiple... Uh, structurally densely interconnected neural systems. And a key point is that these structural connect connections are relatively fixed. Um, so one major question, therefore, is how does our brain adapt flexibly to the constant changes around us? And my general take-home message uh, of today's talk is that the major ascending neuromodulatory systems that originate from the midbrain such as uh, those of dopamine and noradrenaline, might be particularly well suited to, to do this, to fulfill this functionality. It's the chemical neuromodulators that adapt the output of our uh, relatively fixed neural networks to the constantly changing environment. And so indeed the brain faces, constantly faces, a variety of computational dilemmas. Depending on task demands, those neural networks need to exhibit stability or flexibility, accuracy or speed, uh, generalization or multitasking. And I'll focus on the first of these dilemmas, the stability-flexibility trade-off. Um, and all of these dilemmas are core to, to a, a fascinating construct that, however, is ill-defined, cognitive control. But it generally refers to that set of mental processes that allow us to obtain our goals by resisting distractions, impulses, temptations. It's a hallmark of the human brain, um, so it's not a problem. I uh, expect for you to focus fully on my uh, talk for the next 40 minutes, uh, right? Uh, or maybe not. Um, maybe it's going to be difficult. Um, after all, focus, control, is costly, extremely costly. Also, opportunity costly. Some of the messages that you might receive on your phones or laptops might well turn out to be much more relevant than my talk. Um, sometimes we need to let go of focus and to exert flexibility. And so what we need is a meta-level ability to decide when to exert focus and when rather to let go of focus and to flexibly respond to novel input. Uh, so how, how do we do that? And uh, to answer that question, we need to uh, reconceptualize the problem of cognitive control uh, as a problem of reinforcement learning and decision making, rather than only as a problem of uh, implementation, as recognized, of course, by various other people like Matt Botvinnik, Wouter Kohl, and Amitai Shenhoff. And, so now my, and also my take-home message that the chemical neuromodulators adapt our brain to its uh, changing environment is grounded in part in this observation that they contribute to arbitration and to decision-making between different cognitive or computational, often opponent, strategies. But I'll start with uh, defining chemical neuromodulation, um, highlighting three uh, what I think are general principles of chemical neuromodulation. I'll then zoom in on the dopamine system uh, for today and highlight um, a major problem in neurology and psychiatry today, which is that there's large variability in the effects of dopaminergic drugs, huh? the drugs that are so commonly used in psychiatry and neurology. Um, and then I'll illustrate how the general principles can account for some of these paradoxical effects by taking you with me on a quick historical tour through previous pharmacological chemical neuroimaging studies, which really represent two separate lines of work, uh, one focusing on striatal function, learning and choice, and one focusing on frontal, prefrontal control function. 
And then in the second part of my talk, I'll uh, present ongoing work in which we begin to integrate these dual roles um, uh, of dopamine. And I'll finish by uh, highlighting uh, some new questions, some more speculative hypotheses uh, that arise from this work. Okay, so what's chemical neuromodulation? What are its general principles? Um, generally refers to that set of neurochemical processes that uh, curtail or prolong, augment or diminish, uh, effects of fast signaling uh, in neuronal networks, often conditional on the baseline firing state of the postsynaptic cell. So this neuromodulatory mode is often distinguished from the kind of fast direct signaling uh, of the classic neurotransmitter mode via glutamate and gamma, and it's rather the control exerted on that classic neurotransmission. And while these neuromodulatory systems are often characterized as broadcast signals uh, due to their widespread innovation of uh, large parts of the brain, their manip manipulation actually has radically different functional consequences depending on where they act in the brain. So in the case of dopamine, which innervates uh, multiple relatively segregated frontostriatal circuits, we now know, um, yeah, it's quite well established, that the motor, cognitive and motivational effects of dopamine uh, reflect modulation of the dorsolateral, dorsomedial, ventromedial frontostriatal circuits, respectively. And this regional specialization uh, stems in part from regional differences in the density of different receptor types, uh, but also regional differences in the density of different projection neurons, and regional differences in the speed of reuptake, for example. Uh, a second principle, um, which I believe generalizes across, across neuromodulatory systems, uh, is that they exhibit an exquisite capacity for self-regulation, uh, with short latency, uh, high amplitude, phasic responses being thought to be controlled by the more sustained tonic levels of activity, perhaps via presynaptic feedback, uh, negative feedback regulation or inhibition of synthesis and release. And what follows, in part from that, is the now well-established inverted U-shaped dose-response curve, where drugs that increase receptor stimulation have positive effects in systems with low baseline levels of activity, but detrimental overdose effects in systems with already high baseline levels of activity. So to recap, uh, I've made three general points that likely hold for all chemical neuromodulatory systems. Um, first, these pathways innervate multiple neural systems with different functions. Second, these systems self-regulate to maintain uh, equilibrium. And third, um, their effects depend on the baseline state of the system. Now, to illustrate these principles, I'd like to focus on the dopamine system, as I said already, because it is so widely implicated in both healthy and disordered function. Of course, the cognitive role of dopamine is keenly illustrated by its implication in ADHD, but also Parkinson's disease, and various healthy states of stress and fatigue, all characterized by cognitive control deficits, which can be remedied by dopaminergic drugs. But there is that major problem. There's huge variability in both the direction and extent of these dopaminergic drug effects. So consider, for example, ADHD, where symptoms of inattention and, and hyperactivity are often treated uh, with psychostimulants that increase dopamine as well as noradrenaline. Uh, but consider, uh, on the other hand, Parkinson's disease, where dopamine-enhancing medication can rather contribute to impulse control disorders, leading in a considerable proportion of patients to um, for example, uh, compulsive gambling, gambling addiction. And indeed, we've shown uh, with dopamine PET imaging that gambling addiction is uh, accompanied by increased dopamine synthesis capacity in the striatum. So how can that be? How can the same neuromodulator have such opposite effects in different people? Uh, so let me illustrate how we've begun to address these questions in the past. Um, until recently, the dopamine community uh, has been relatively split, with some research lines focusing on striatal function, learning, choice, and some uh, lines focusing on uh, uh, cognitive control and working memory. Uh, now, in the domain of uh, striatal function, we've um, 
I contributed with various other people uh, some empirical foundations of the dopaminergic learning hypothesis. For example, by showing not only a relationship between re reinforcement learning, reward learning, and individual differences in dopamine synthesis capacity, measured with dopamine PET, but also a link between the effect of a dopamine drug on reward learning and baseline levels of dopamine measured with PET, so that the same drug improved reward learning in low dopamine subjects, but impaired reward learning in high dopamine subjects. And so that data showed that dopaminergic drug effects on cognition, on reward-based learning in this case, depend on individual differences in baseline levels of dopamine. And the implication of this, and that's the point I want to make, is that if we want to isolate effects of dopaminergic drugs, we better take into account the baseline state of the system. So in the domain of uh, prefrontal function, uh, we've contributed, again, with various others, to revising the, the common hypothesis that the cognitive effects of dopamine reflect direct action in the prefrontal cortex selectively and have high, rather highlighted a role for striatal dopamine. So the starting point of this cognitive control work was the observation that uh, cognitive control and working memory are multi-componential phenomena comprising not just the stable maintenance of task-relevant representations, but also their flexible updating. And based on various lines of evidence, uh, not least uh, computational modeling work by uh, Randy O'Reilly and Michael Frank, but also the observation that there is neurochemical reciprocity between prefrontal dopamine and striatal dopamine, we put forward this notion, this idea, that dopamine might modulate the stable and flexible aspects of cognitive control by acting on different prefrontal and striatal regions, respectively. And so I developed a, a, a delayed response task uh, to separately assess these stable and flexible aspects of cognitive control in terms of distractor resistance and task switching, respectively. And then, in keeping with this functional and neurochemical reciprocity, um, a series of studies followed showing opposite effects of dopamine or dopaminergic drugs on these flexible and stable aspects of control. So, for example, patients with Parkinson's disease exhibit increased switch costs, but reduced distractor costs, uh, corresponding to cognitive inflexibility, but enhanced uh, cognitive stability. And moreover, uh, administration of dopaminergic medication um, restored that pattern. So, remediating cognitive flexibility, reducing task switch costs, but actually also restoring to normal cognitive um, uh, instability or distractibility. Uh, subsequent pharmacological imaging work showed that uh, the effects of a dopaminergic drug on switch-related activity was found selectively in the striatum and not in the prefrontal cortex, um, whereas that same drug modulated distractor-related activity in the prefrontal cortex, but not in the striatum. So that double dissociation then led us to conclude um, that dopaminergic drugs have contrasting effects on the flexible and stable aspects of cognitive control by modulating the striatum and prefrontal cortex um, respectively. Uh, so more generally, control, cognitive control requires dynamic adjustment of a balance between distinct brain regions depending on task demands, and that balance might be uh, mediated by dopamine. That adjustment might be subserved by dopamine. The next question is then, how does dopamine alter that balance between cognitive stability and flexibility? And according to current gating models, uh, striatal dopamine regulates the flexible gating of actions proportional to their costs and benefits by increasing activity in the go pathway and decreasing activity in the no-go pathway. Um, and critically, this role of striatal dopamine extends to the flexible gating of cognitive actions uh, maintained in working memory. In essence, this cognitive gating models uh, represent an integration of classic top-down biasing models of cognitive control and classic basal ganglia models, according to which striatal dopamine lowers the threshold for the gating of action. 
And inspired by this theoretical work, we set up a number of uh, empirical studies to test the hypothesis that the biasing by the prefrontal cortex of task-relevant processing in posterior sensory cortex might be controlled by striatal dopamine, such that task-relevant uh, processing in posterior cortex is updated or gated only when striatal dopamine um, opens the gate for attentional switching, if you will. So how did we do that? Um, in these experiments, we presented subjects with uh, bidimensional face scene stimuli, um, uh, like this one, this is just one example. Uh, and on each trial, they were presented with two of these stimuli, and they had to choose between these stimuli, based on attention to either the faces or the scenes. And critically, they were instructed, they had to switch attention to the other dimension uh, as soon as they detected that novel exemplars were introduced of that dimension. So imagine subjects attending to faces as soon as they detected that two novel exemplars, two novel scenes were introduced, they had to switch discriminating between the two stimuli based on the scenes rather than the faces. Now, these switch trials elicited highly significant bold signal in the striatum, as well as the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus. And moreover, there were very strong attentional gain effects, with signal in the uh, fusiform face area being strongest when people switch to faces, and bold signal in the parahippocampal place area being strongest when people switch to places. And this general pattern of bold signal was nicely captured by a dynamic causal model in which triatal switch-related activity modulated an effective connection from the prefrontal cortex to stimulus-specific posterior cortex. So these data were generally consistent with the hypothesis um, that the striatum guides attention switching by gating the cognitive output of the prefrontal cortex, if you will. In a separate drug study, we found that administration of the dopaminergic drug bromocryptine altered switch-related activity selectively in the striatum, in a region of the striatum that was right adjacent to a region of the striatum exhibiting a strong link between a behavioral index of attentional switching on this task, uh, plotted here on the x-axis, um, and white matter integrity. Uh, as indexed by frac uh, fractional anisotropy measured with DTI. And moreover, probabilistic tractography revealed that white matter tracts originating from that striatal FA region culminated in a region of prefrontal cortex that was, right, uh, uh, that was also exhibiting here in blue um, significant dopaminergic drug effects on functional connectivity with that striatal bolt region during attention switching. So to recap, what we showed here is that the dopaminergic drug modulated switch-related signal in the striatum, a region of the striatum that connects structurally uh, and communicates functionally with the prefrontal cortex during attention switching. So based on that work, um, we concluded that uh, striatal dopamine might potentiate cognitive flexibility by gating attention to a cognitive task rule via modulation of prefrontal control over task-relevant processing. But the key question remains, of course, and that is how then does striatal dopamine set the threshold for gating a cognitive task or a cognitive strategy, if you will? And so according to these gating models, but also currently popular resource allocation models of cognitive control, we allocate resources to uh, a, a difficult cognitive task or to cognitive control, uh, depending on its expected value, depending on its benefits versus costs. And so that then leads me to my current, our current line of work, where we begin to integrate these dual roles of dopamine on the one hand in reinforcement learning and choice, and on the other hand, in cognitive control and working memory. And specifically, we've been working with this idea that striatal dopamine might affect cognitive control indirectly by altering the value of cognitive work. 
And according to the uh, opponent actor learning model, or the OPAL model, uh, by Michael Frank sitting here in front, um, stridal dopamine increases the weight on the benefits versus the costs of an action, also a cognitive action, by altering the balance between activity in the go and no-go pathway of the basal ganglia. And so to test this hypothesis, Andrew Westbrook, sitting over there, also presenting this work this afternoon, um, revised uh, a cognitive effort-based choice task uh, together with Michael Frank that he first developed with Todd Braver in St. Louis to assess whether monetary, uh, whether the, uh, to assess the monetary value that people assign to doing, executing, or repeating a, cogn a difficult cognitive task. And in this experiment, uh, we had three different phases. In the first phase, people were exposed to different, easy, and more difficult sort of NBAC versions, classic NBAC versions of working memory. So they basically executed a one-back, a two-back, a three-back, and a four-back task. Then in the second discounting phase, um, people indicated by a button press whether they preferred to repeat an easy or a difficult version of this task for various uh, monetary uh, payoffs. And critically, we titrated, or Andrew titrated, titrated the monetary amount uh, that could be received for doing the easy task until subjective equivalence was reached, um, depending on choice, so that uh, these indifference points could be uh, derived that correspond essentially to the subjective value of cognitive effort. Okay, so to assess uh, the role of striatal dopamine, uh, we conducted a large multi-session pharmacological uh, PET fMRI study in 100 healthy volunteers. Uh, that was certainly a team effort, um, 50 of whom completed this cognitive effort-based choice task. Um, and so as part of this study, they also uh, acquired, um, they also underwent a dopamine PET scan with the radio tracer F-DOPA, uptake of which ref, uh, indexes the degree to which dopamine is synthesized in the striatal terminals of midbrain dopamine neurons. And so there was large variability in this healthy student population. Some subjects exhibited high dopamine synthesis capacity, others low. It's a relatively stable index across different sessions. And the subjective value that was calculated in that critical discounting phase that I just described um, is plotted here on the y-axis separately as a function of task difficulty, uh, but also as a function of baseline dopamine synthesis capacity. So as you can see, as predicted, the subjective value uh, of cognitive effort uh, was significantly greater in subjects with high baseline levels of dopamine synthesis capacity, here in green, than in subjects with low baseline levels of dopamine synthesis capacity. And this effect was centered on the caudate nucleus, the dorsal part of the striatum. And moreover, the subjective value of, of cognitive effort was modulated also by administration of the non-specific catecholamine enhancer methylphenidate, as well as the dopamine selective uh, receptor agent sulparide. However, critically, this effect uh, was baseline dependent while the drug's enhanced value of cognitive effort in the low dopamine subjects, um, it left unaffected uh, and in some trials impaired uh, or reduced the value of work in high dopamine subjects. Now, based on this computational OPAL model uh, proposed by Michael and Anne, uh, Michael Frank and Anne Collins, we can make more specific predictions about the effects of dopamine. Um, namely, the model predicts that high dopamine states are associated with increased weight on the benefits and reduced weight on the costs. So in the third phase of this experiment that I haven't yet described, uh, Andrew sampled, to assess that, choices on either end of the indifference point, allowing him to plot a full psychometric uh, curve, quantifying the degree to which high effort selection on the y-axis um, varies with the difference uh, in subjective value between the high and the low effort tasks. And OPAL model simulations confirmed that increases in sensitivity to the benefits and decreases in sensitivity to the costs uh, correspond or are accompanied by a steepening of this psychometric curve on the right-hand side uh, 
but a flattening uh, of this left-hand side of the curve, respectively. And interestingly, dopamine had exactly this asymmetric effect, uh, both in terms of individual differences in dorsal striatal dopamine, with high dopamine subjects exhibiting a steepening of the curve on the right-hand side and a flattening of the curve on the left-hand side, as well as as a function of these dopaminergic drug administration. So these effects were highly convergent um, to suggest that dopamine increases the sensitivity to the benefits, but decreases the sensitivity to the costs. This conf was confirmed by um, statistical regression analyses, uh, but also by dynamic gaze patterns measured during this third part of the experiment. Uh, now, because in this experiment, the benefit and the cost attributes of choice were presented separately on the screen, Andrew could disentangle the separate contributions to choice of gaze at benefits and gaze at costs. So plotted here on the y-axis is the proportion gaze uh, from choice onset, zero point, uh, at the benefits in green and at the costs in blue. Um, separately, for high dopamine subjects in the top and the low dopamine subjects in the bottom. And so, as you can see, um, for high effort selection trials, gaze at benefit was increased relative to gaze uh, at at the costs, and this effect was potentiated by dopamine, shown here as a function of individual differences, dopamine synthesis capacity, but it was also the case as a function of the dopamine drug administration, not shown here. So from this, we then concluded, and I should say, Andrew has done much more sophisticated analyses, together with Michael, to disentangle the precise nature of this effect of dopamine, and I really encourage you to go and talk with Andrew. But for this uh, purpose of this talk, what we can conclude is that these results um, establish that striatal dopamine can gate a cognitive task in proportion to its benefits and costs. So what this set of findings illustrate more generally is that dopamine might adapt our neural networks to our environment by helping us arbitrate between different rules by altering the weight on the costs and the benefits. Now, these findings also raise an important next question, uh, which is to be addressed in future work, which is that if the midbrain, um, the dopamine midbrain, the midbrain dopamine system, controls arbitration between cognitive rules or cognitive tasks, um, then what controls the midbrain? Um, and in the case of dopamine, we can ask, how do we set the value of cognitive work? And this is not trivial because Valuation is context-dependent. For example, cognitive work might not be so valuable uh, if the payoff is low, or uh, when the environment is volatile, or uncontrollable, or opportunity costly. So one intriguing possibility that I'd, I'd like to uh, address in future work is that the dopaminergic midbrain is controlled by top-down control signals from, say, the medial prefrontal cortex which computes key statistical metaparameters of the environment, like its controllability, its opportunity cost, or its volatility. And more speculatively, perhaps it is the medial prefrontal cortex that prioritizes the striatal or prefrontal midbrain projections by setting their baseline dopamine tone. Um, and indeed, from work with, uh, by, uh, by Antonia Straffella, uh, we know who has combined uh, TMS and dopamine PET in interesting ways. We know that transcranial stimulation of the frontal cortex can alter dopamine release in topographically selective uh, regions uh, of the striatum. So together, these insights raise the hypothesis that dopaminergic drugs might alter the balance between distinct cognitive strategies or rules by having paradoxical effects depending on the baseline tone in distinct parts of the brain, distinct circuits. So in Parkinson's disease, for example, dopaminergic drugs might bias the system towards more flexibility, um, but less stability, by restoring dopamine levels in the striatum, but overdosing dopamine levels in the prefrontal cortex. In ADHD, by contrast, 
dopaminergic drugs might have the exact opposite effect, biasing the system towards greater stability by restoring prefrontal dopamine and noradrenaline um, levels, but less flexibility by detrimentally overdosing striatal dopamine levels. And finally, I want to point out that we, we have reason to believe that such meta-level arbitration effects of dopaminergic drugs um, are not restricted to the uh, adjustment of the flexibility-stability trade-off, but likely extend to on other uh, cognitive trade-offs, such as, for example, the one between instrumental control, commonly associated with more dorsal frontostriatal circuitry, and Pavlovian control, commonly associated with, um, with the ventral striatum. So in two separate studies now, we've seen that methylphenidate biases the system or people towards more instrumental control and away from Pavlovian autopilot effects, but only for people with low baseline mental capacity uh, who exhibit strong Pavlovian autopilot effects at baseline. Um, methylphenidate actually had the exact opposite effects, uh, biasing the system away from instrumental control, sorry, uh, towards these autopilot effects um, in people with uh, low mental capacity, low baseline levels, uh, levels of mental capacity, um, who actually showed very high levels of Pavlovian bias at, uh, at baseline. Okay, so to conclude, um, Chemical neuromodulators are well suited to regulate uh, key computational trade-offs. Their effects might depend on the basal tone of different projection systems, which might reflect the perceived uh, statistics of the environment. Uh, and therapeutic drugs like methylphenidate might counteract this bias elicited by the environment by restoring systems with low baseline tone and overdosing uh, systems with high baseline tone. Now, there's, of course, a whole range of questions that arises from this speculative hypothesis, um, but I'll leave it for now and, again, uh, thank my group for, uh, for doing the work that I've presented, and in particular, uh, Andrew, for the second part. All right, thanks that very much. Fast. That was great. Mm -hmm. um, we have a good bit of time for questions, mm -hmm. so uh, the microphones will be on their way shortly. Um, there was one right here. Hi, really interesting talk. Uh, I'm wondering whether you know if prefrontal regions uh, represent hard and easy tasks differentially, and if so, and um, if not, how does dopamine release in the prefrontal region actually select for um, like a, a, a specific control of hard tasks versus easy tasks? Yeah, so I, I guess what we're su suggesting is that um, um, the selection of different strategies might uh, be mediated by indirect effects on the stridal uh, system, um, which might um, uh, then have indirect effects on the, on the prefrontal cortex. So what we know from, um, there's very little evidence, I would say, to suggest that there is a particular set of neurons that represent a difficult task or a different set of neurons that represent an easy task, um, but the prefrontal cortex rather adapt to its, uh, its environment, its, its demand, so that neurons might represent, neural activity might represent the current task rule, the currently relevant task rule. Um, so how, how the selection and the representation of these different task rules um, uh, is instantiated I can't really speak to that here uh, at all, but I think there is reason to believe that the prefrontal cortex might uh, represent uh, the task rules that we have learned in the particular context uh, that is relevant. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. 
So before the next question, if the two speakers um, who were talking right after this could come down here and kind of uh, be ready to go, that'd be great. Um, does someone else have a microphone? Ah, there's one way up there. Oh, this one? Um, I'm going to ask a question while the microphone is making it to this person. Many of us are in this can I, room. Can I ask? I've oh, got a microphone right here. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Um, my understanding is that uh, dopamine via different oh, receptor subtypes connect over widely varying time scales. Can you wave so I know where you are? Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll start again. Um, I'm under the impression that dopamine can act over a wide range of timescales by different receptor subtypes. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the timescales of the cognitive control that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point and the kind of um, mid-brain switch that I'm speculating about here is actually as a function of trait differences, right, between different people. And I think the next obvious step is to, to assess whether, whether, this, uh, whether these uh, drugs can have rather different effects um, depending on um, uh, more instantaneous changes. So I believe that some of these effects generalize across different time scales, but we don't really have evidence to it yet. We're starting to look at this meta-level arbitration within a particular task where we're changing demands, uh, fluctuating demands within a task, and the, we do see that uh, in this case, methylphenidate, the non-specific drug, has opposite effects depending on um, the strategy that is at hand within that period of the task. Um, but this general uh, notion might well uh, uh, generalize across these different time, time scales. And is it, is it plausible that uh, this mechanism could work on the order of hundreds of milliseconds? Um, I don't think, so what we're trying to uh, address here is effects of these drugs, and these drugs are unlikely uh, to change states. I mean, they're gonna have an indirect effect on these millisecond uh, levels, but the, 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 uh, the general mechanism that I've put forward here speaks to the slightly longer okay. time scales when I'm talking about traits in people, or let's say blocks of, uh, uh, of task contexts. I see. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so you suggested that the basal tone of uh, the dopamine level is dependent on the statistics of the environment. So I was wondering. Yeah, speculating. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering. So is it being studied then uh, whether some kind of. Uh, changes in the environmental statistics would induce some kind of long-term change in this basal tone? Um, the work is starting to be done uh, on that. So we do know, um, for example, that if we interfere with the um, medial frontal cortex from rodent work, um, that uh, the RAFE responds differently. Um, so, and that affects... So, uh, the response of the RAFE as a function of controllability, uh, it's a different system, uh, I know, but uh, is established to depend on, A, the controllability of the environment, uh, and also most recently, depending on the threat levels of the environment. So in this other chemical neuromodulatory system, there's beginning to be some evidence uh, that the response and the, and the, the, the nature of, of these midbrain uh, activity patterns varies depending on the, on the context, on the parameter, the sort of statistical characteristics of the, um, um, of the environment, and also that the medial prefrontal cortex might have a role in that. Uh, so I think there is a few kind of pieces of evidence suggesting that that might uh, be the case. I think the, the wide open question, uh, the speculation here, is that uh, that might be accompanied by different baseline levels um, of dopamine or serotonin in different circuits. That that might be a mechanism by which these uh, midbrain activity, uh, midbrain systems have rather opposite effects depending on, it can bias the system towards one uh, kind of strategy relative to another. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, many of us are in this room exactly because we find mental effort pleasurable, at least in yeah. some context. So 
how would you reconcile that with you know the the focus that everybody in the field has had on kind of the cost of mental mm. health? Really important point. We're just starting to work on that um, because there seems to be this interesting Goldilocks level of effort that's attractive, right? As soon as um, a task becomes too difficult and we can essentially predict that we're going to do poorly, it's going to be very aversive. But there is definitely a range of, um, I guess, difficulty that can be very attractive. And this is exactly what we're isolating right now and whether that... Um, that same system, or perhaps a, a different system, noradrenaline system implicating in outcome uncertainty, might rather be uh, related to uh, establishing the, um, um, the attraction to, uh, cool. to cognitive effort. Yeah. Um, other questions? We have time for one more if anybody has one. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again.